Hi everyone, I'm Daisy and this is my second video on chapter 2 of the IB Physics syllabus which is all about mechanics. So in part 1 what we did was we went through um, some tips and tricks on how to identify the best approach for answering a mechanics question and we looked at one example question. In part 2 of this um, video what we're going to do is um, try and apply this to some more practice questions. So we're going to look at three different questions and um, apply what we learnt last time to solving them in the best way possible. So these questions are all exam style questions taken from Cognity. Um, what I would really recommend, as I said last time, is um, as much as possible try and pause the video, read the question yourself, have a go at the question, then press play when you're ready to sort of hear my explanation of how to do the question. Um, I know it can be really easy just to sort of sit and watch the whole video, um, but physics really is all about practicing in order to get um, the best marks you can. Um, so I would really, really recommend just trying to do as much as possible as you can yourself. Um, if you need to sort of just play a little bit to get a little bit of a hint or maybe how to approach it, go for that, but then hit pause again and try and um, do as much of it yourself as you possibly can. Alright then, so let's get started. Um, this is the first question we're going to look at. Um, so we're told that figure 4 shows a parcel of mass 5 kilograms about to be released at the top of a quarter pipe of radius r is 2 metres, where it will slide on a smooth surface until it encounters an ideal spring with spring constant k is 40 newtons per metre. Determine the maximum change in length of the spring. Alright, so first thing we're going to want to think about is what kind of approach are we going to want to take? Are we going to be looking at momentum? Well, we've kind of got two things colliding, but what does a spring do when it collides? You don't really know. It doesn't really have a velocity or a mass, so you can't really find a uh, momentum. So momentum is probably not going to be all that helpful. And what about forces? So I mean, forces, we can see that there's going to be a, a force acting on that mass as it's pulled downwards due to gravity. But because it's on a curved slope, that force is going to be changing all the time, um, the component of it at least, that's going to be affecting the motion of the mass. So looking at forces is probably going to be really complicated in this situation. Okay, so then what about acceleration? Well, we can use acceleration when we've got an object that's just falling under gravity. Um, we can use SUVAT, that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, it's not just falling under gravity, right? There's going to be this reaction force from the slope as it falls down. So that's probably not going to be too helpful. But what we have got is we've got a mass that starts up high, it moves down the slope, um, it contracts this spring. So we can see that energy is being transferred from one form to another in this question, which means a really helpful approach is going to be to consider how energy is conserved in the problem. All right, so what kind of energy have we got at the start? What kind of energy have we got at the end? So we can see that as the mass starts, it's quite high up um, compared to where it ends. So at the start, we're going to have gravitational potential energy. Um, and then our mass um, starts sliding down the slope. Um, it's going to pick up speed, it's going to pick up velocity. Um, velocity is obviously always associated with kinetic energy. And then it's compressing that spring, and what energy that spring is going to hold is going to be elastic potential. What's important to remember when we're doing a question that involves sort of conservation is we don't really care what happens in the middle. Um, we know that the energy in the middle is going to be the same as the energy at the start and the same as the energy at the end. So we can just sort of ignore that middle step. And let's just think about the gravitational potential energy at the start and the elastic potential energy at the end. And so like how we sort of approach that momentum question, what I would really recommend doing is split your page into so on this left hand side we've got gravitational potential energy and on the right hand side we have oops, elastic all right so what we need to do like with that momentum question from last time is we need to try and find out how much energy we have at the start and how much energy we have at the end and then we can equate them so gravitational potential energy and this is according to the formula sheet given by um, delta e is mg delta h so M is our mass, that's going to be 5 kilograms. Um, G is 9.81 from the formula sheet. And delta H, um, it's not given to us explicitly, um, but we're told this is a quarter pipe. Um, so it starts at the sort of top of this quarter pipe. We can kind of think of this whole thing as being, whoops, this is a terrible drawing, but that's going to be the um, circle that that is a quarter of. Um, so the height through which the mass is going to fall going to be the radius 
which is what we're given. So delta H is going to be um, 2 metres in this case. So if we plug this all in, we're going to get 5 times 9.81 times 2, which is going to be 98.1 joules. All right, so then looking over to the right-hand side of our page when we're considering the elastic potential energy at the end, well, according to the formula sheet, elastic potential energy is given by half K delta X squared. All right, so we know that these two energies have got to be the same. So we know that 98.1 has got to be half times K, which we're given in the question and we're told is 40 newtons per meter. And that's going to be times delta X squared. So delta x squared is going to be um, 98.1 divided by half times 40. Half times 40 is 20, divided by 20. And therefore, to get um, delta x, we just need to take the square root of that quantity. And um, if you put that into your calculator, you should get that the answer to the question is 2.2 newtons. So in this case, you can see that splitting that page in half, just like we did with momentum, is a really good approach to try and solve a question in a really logical way and to see what is going on at different stages. All right, so here is the third and final question we're going to be looking at today. So we're told a car of mass 1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms is being dragged by a wire at a constant speed of 18 metres per second up a road that is inclined at an angle of 8 degrees from the horizontal. The wheels are locked and the coefficient of static friction between the wheels and the road is 0.23. So first we're asked to draw a free body diagram of the forces acting on the car. So if we want to draw a free body diagram in a question, that's probably quite a good hint that the best approach to take to this question is going to be to think about forces. So the approach we're going to take here is to consider the forces acting on the car. So let's get going with drawing this free body diagram. So in this situation, everything is ab happening along this slope. So let's start by drawing in our slope at eight degrees. We don't need to actually think about drawing a car properly. We can just draw it as a dot. Um, it's going to be much easier than um, to testing my artistic abilities. So one force we're always going to have um, whenever we draw a free body diagram pretty much is going to be mg. It's going to be our gravity. It's always going to act vertically downwards. So let's draw that one first. We can label it as mg. Um, the car is on a slope. Um, anything where there is a surface uh, means we're going to want to draw a reaction force at 90 degrees to that surface. So, um, oh, it's going to look more like that. We're going to have a reaction force. Okay, then along the slope, we're told it's being dragged up by this wire. So if it's being dragged by a wire, there must be a tension in that wire. So we can draw a tension force acting up the slope. And we're also told about the coefficient of static friction. And uh, so what that implies is that there must be a frictional force acting down the slope. So let's draw that down here. All right, so those are the four forces that are acting on this situation. Part B then asks us to state the rate of change of momentum of the car. So we know that our rate of change of momentum, which we can write as um, delta P, over delta t is actually our force, our net overall force. Um, so let's think about this. We're told our car is moving at a constant speed of 18 meters per second. If a car is moving at a constant speed, um, or any object is moving at a constant speed for that matter, Newton's first law tells us that there must be no net force acting on the vehicle. So therefore, data change of momentum have got to be equal to zero. And then let's look at this last part. By considering the forces on the car, determine the tension in the wire. Okay, what's going to make this question much easier is to rotate the angle at which we look at the problem. So instead of thinking about it with this slope at 8 degrees, let's sort of tilt our point of vision so we're looking at it sort of parallel to that 8 degrees. Um, and so the 8 degrees appears flat. So in this case, we've got our road. We've got a reaction force acting upwards. We've got a friction acting to the right, tension acting to the left, and we've also got this mg acting at an angle. So this angle is 8 degrees, and this is mg. 
Okay, so what we now want to think about is that we know the overall net force must be zero, which means the horizontal components must sum to zero and the vertical components must also sum to zero. So let's first think about the horizontal. So to the left, um, all we've got is tension. And that's got to be balanced by everything that's going to the right. So to the right, we've got um, a friction. Let's call that F for now. And we're going to have a bit of gravity moving to the right as well. Um, so we can see that if we take components here, this is like the opposite. This is the bit we're interested in. This is a hypotenuse. This is an adjacent. So we're interested in this sort of opposite hypotenuse thing. So we're going to be interested in sine. Sine of 8 degrees um, multiplied by mg. Okay, that's all well and good. Um, we know what mg sine 8 is, um, but we don't know what our frictional force is. So we know that frictional force is our um, coefficient of friction, um, mu times by our reaction force, R, plus mg sine 8. Um, Alright, but we still don't actually know what a reaction force is. Um, there's no obvious way to um, sort of determine that from the question. So we're going to have to also consider what's happening vertically in this problem. So vertically, um, going upwards, we've got a reaction force, and that's going to be at, um, balanced out by a component of this um, gravity. And so we've already used a sine, so that's probably a pretty good guess it's going to be cosine. But we can see we want this bit labelled A that's adjacent. Um, so soccatoa, this is going to be plus um, mg, not plus even mg cos of 8. Okay, great. So we could then substitute that in, right? Um, we can get that T is going to be mu mg cos 8 plus mg sine of 8. Um, coefficient of static friction is 0 0.23. Um, mass is 10 to the 3 kilograms. G is 9.81. Cos of 8, you just put in your calculator like that. And again, we've got 10 to the 3 times 9.81 times sine of 8. And if you put that all into your calculator, you should arrive at the result that our um, tension force is equal to 3,600 newtons. Okay, great. So that was the final question we wanted to look at. Let's sort of go to a summary now. So whenever you're looking at a chapter two mechanics question, I would always recommend sort of making a plan before you sort of dive into the question. You're always told in humanities subjects when you're writing an essay that you should plan before you write. And I think this is also quite true in mathematical subjects as well. It can be really useful to dive in with no idea what you're doing. But it's a really good idea to just think about what approach am I going to take for this question? What equations might be relevant? Um, what does it look like? Let's draw a diagram. All of these things are a really good idea to think about before you get started. Um, if you decide that SUVAT is the best approach, um, I think it's a really good idea to fill in all the information you know. So like um, I did earlier and I wrote the SUVAT, um, if you actually um, write out what you know and make sure you're only considering either horizontal or vertical for each part of the question. If you've got an energy or momentum question, uh, like we demonstrated, splitting the page into a before and an after section with a little diagram of each um, can be a really, really good idea just to sort of make it clearer in your head what's going on and to work out what kind of energy is being transformed into what other kind of energy. If you're looking at forces like we did in that last question there, rotating the system to a convenient angle is a really good idea just to get a much clearer image um, of what's going on and not have to worry about sort of resolving too many awkward angles. So in this example here, um, we only had to resolve the mg into mg sine 8 and mg cos 8. If we'd have done it in this picture here, um, we would have had to resolve a reaction force, we'd have had to resolve friction, and we'd have had to resolve tension, which would have made the question much more tricky to deal with. So um, that's everything in today's video. I hope you found it helpful. Um, if you would like some online tutoring with a tutor just like me or one of our many other amazing physics tutors who all got top marks in the IB, uh, I would really recommend checking out lanternaeducation.com for more information. So thank you and I'll see you next time.